You don't need to worry about much, in truth, because everything really is taken care of. So I have struggled with this to get something down that didn't seem pompous or silly or, or something. And I, it wasn't long enough. I didn't have anything. And, and yet everything that's been said, every prayer that's been prayed, every song that's sung, the words of which, and this, had just been just prepared. The director had been directing it. And I didn't realise the whole fullness of the scale. I just realised my part and it seemed to be inadequate. And so I was worried. And the director is everything. This, our God, is a God of stories. And as a small child, there's nothing that I love. I love stories. Stories, the stories. At the end of the night, going to bed, I'd drive my mother mad just crying for more stories. And it's so deeply in us, the love of stories. And this is a book of stories. Just great, 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 great stories. And our God is a storyteller. And you meet people and you read of people who were searching for truth and meaning. And they looked at all the religions of the world and all the writings. And they were philosophies and their expositions, or they were grandiose and wild myth. But this was just a book of stories. And it deeply touched them. So, the resurrection. Can we have that first one? This is the Shroud of Turin. And I think, Claire, when you came and chose to um, your piece and compiled it, were you spoiled for pictures of the crucifixion? Were <laughs> yes. there more than you could choose from? Loads, How many pictures millions. can people think of that show the point of the resurrection? Mm. Any? I googled it. I couldn't find one. Not one. Some of the ascension, and but you know, and and ascending to heaven, but not one for all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of pictures of the crucifixion. So this is the Shroud of Turin. And I imagine people know things about it, but I'm going to take from the beginning because nobody knows anything about it. This was um, a holy a relic, and it was purported to be the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in after his crucifixion. It wasn't owned by the Catholic Church, um, as opposed to a lot of people's beliefs. It was actually owned by uh, the king of um, Italy, the Lombardi family, until about the 1980s, or quite recently anyway, and it got handed over to the Catholic Church. It's been burnt. There was a fire and it burnt. The box, the silver box it was in, melted and dripped um, molten um, silver, and it burnt these holes. But it was always very important, and it was always brought out at um, special occasions. It was always held out, you know, right from the 13th century. And, um, but in 18, late 18 something, it was brought out to be the backdrop of a wedding. And could we have the second picture? And the photographer who photographed it, when he went back to the darkroom to process photographs, this jumped out from the negative. No one had ever seen this before. And that must have set him down on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> because there's this extraordinarily detailed picture of a man. And the cloth went right round that big long one. So it went right round the head and back round the, the back of him. And of course, there was lots of controversy. And was it a painting? Was it this? Was it that? Um, so in the 1980s, they spent um, a team from Los Alamos, which is where they did all the nuclear research for the bomb and everything. So high, you know, the highest tech people. Uh, not necessarily believers. The photographer was Jewish. Lovely man. I'll, I'll look him up, Barry Schwartz. So I'll give his name somehow afterwards. And who photographed it all. And they went there pretty much, we're going to nail this. We'll go and we'll find out and we'll examine it and we can say if it's a painting or if it's a painting. And all they came back with after is what they said, it, what it wasn't. And they knew it wasn't a painting, first of all, straight away, immediately. 
because there was nothing laid on top of the fibres, as the painting would have been laid on top of the fibres. The only thing on top of the fibres was, was blood. And that was examined, and that did have haemoglobin, had a high amount of bilirubin, which is released when there's uh, human bodies under extreme duress for a long period of the time. Um, but there was no, nothing was laid on it. And as they examined in more detail down to the atomic level, there, these are nuclear scientists, they found that the image imprinted in there had so many extraordinary qualities, it's not really worth going into them all, but it's imprinted into the actual structure of the linen, the image. And the closer it is, where it was actually touching, like on the hands here and on the nose, really imprinted, so you actually get to where it was further away. You could do the, with the information that's even in there, they could make 3D images. And what was so extraordinary from this is that however it was done, we don't have the technology to do it now, yet. Now, the, the, generally, there is um, there's a sort of, is it a, a medieval fake, or is it actually something that happened? And with all the information and everything, and, and we're wise and we're grown-up people, I'm just asking you at this moment to suspend logic and reason and let us pretend it is indeed a fake. And let us examine this as a fake. Because what I want to get to is I want to get to the brilliance of the mind that faked it. Because whoever faked that really, really, really understood what the resurrection was. Because when they faked it, the energy that imprinted those images into that cloth didn't come from a projector or some other way that you might think you could do it. It came from the actual inside, from every single part of it. I mean, it it's, they'll explain, it's much more, but every part, so it wasn't projected on, but every part from the inside coming out. And what's more extraordinary is that, and it's, free, it's holographic, so it's, it's you know, done in a way that, that, that you can make holographs. It's the same, because um, it's complete. It, it's, but what's so extraordinary, it's a foot. It's double exposed. Meaning when that happened, the foot was moving. So the, <laughs> the person who faced this utterly understood it. And not one other painter has ever done it, has actually captured the resurrection. You can just do the other ones. Somebody just with that information was able to do, because it's 3D information, the information was able to produce this. And again. And these, all these details, these dumbbell shapes, these scourges that the Romans had, had dumbbell bits of lead in the whip that would embed into the flesh and then tear out and they draw it out. And I can't remember, there are hundreds of those across. This is not an artist's impression. This is somebody taking the information from the cloth and putting it into its full 3D form. And again, please. And then the face with a piece of the beard torn out. Can we go back to the first, that second one? And we'll leave that up. So I'd like to read from, and I, I haven't, extraordinary, every time, the more I do this, the more really than the less and less I have to say. I just seem to have only a few scriptures and a few, few things to say. I'm going to read from Romans 8. And I'd like to, before I read um, Paul, I'd like to put a sort of a, a caveat. The, the, Paul says some hefty stuff in a book of stories and it's very easy to get him wrong and so when you're with somebody who's truly humble and you, you know you are you're sometimes in the, com in the company of people who are truly humble people it doesn't help it humbles you you shan't be pretentious with them I think Rob Scott Cook is like that and he shines and he twinkles and he's full of life and you can't be pretentious 
And then you start reading, and everything is done with love and humour. So if you imagine yourself as an older person, and the love and humour that you'd have if somebody sort of labour's age came running up to you, all breathless and full of wonder and scandal to tell you they saw the cat pooing in the, in the flower bed. <laughs> you know, that, and you'd feel that, all that warmth and love you would feel to that child. Really? Pooing in there? How wicked was it using loo paper? No. <laughs> how shocking. And then if you understand that's Paul, that everything you read is coming from this point of great humility, great love, extraordinary wisdom, just crackling warmth and love. And it's much easier to read his words in that light. And then you realise they're quite extraordinary. they got warmth. So it starts over. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. But those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And I think this sort of been really... It, this does away with all the sillinesses of all the arguments that people are having currently. And so when you think of the issues that are particularly riveting the church and the body and our place and our understanding with the world, is it's all built down on what sort of flesh things can you do which are all right and what aren't all right and who's to say anyway. And yet Paul's saying really clearly, you can't live in the flesh and please God. It doesn't really matter what your desires are. It doesn't really matter what flavour they are. If you're living in the flesh, you can't live with God, you can't please God. It isn't, that isn't the end. And our teaching and our expectation has been that we try to bring God from the Spirit into the carnal and be active in our carnal life. Now I'm going to carry on and it makes sense. So, however, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit, this is the one, it's already been said today, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. That spirit that did that is in you. Is in us. This guide. This guide. This comforter. This somebody fizzling with wisdom and love is there at our reference whenever we want for guidance and comfort. And comfort doesn't only mean, this is an interesting, funny aside, but comfort doesn't only mean la la, oh dear. Because the origin, you scrape your knee, the origin of the word comfort, and we can get it, come to make fort strong. To make strong is comfort, is the proper origin of the word. And we can use both the comfort and the make strong. There's on the bio tapestry, apparently, I haven't seen it. But there's a, a bit where a, a Norman soldier is looking rather reluctant. And behind him is a priest with a spear pointing in his back. And it says the priest is comforting the soldier, <laughs> <laughs> making him strong to go into battle. So the comforter makes strong, gives counsel. And if the counsel, If we have this guide in us, from where is he guiding us to? And where is he guiding us from? 
because we keep asking God to come back to where we are in our lives of flesh and help us there. And I think God is trying to walk us from. And a lot of people who seek counselling want resolution in their life of flesh, where God is trying to seek to broad. I have people and they're asking, praying, can we pray with them for something? And I think, I, I struggle to pray because what you're praying for me to, that you will be restored in is the very thing God is trying to destroy. This carnality. And the point, and it's only a small point, really, is, is what do we do with this spirit that raised Jesus from the dead? The same spirit in us. What do we do with this? Because we're in real danger. We're in real danger of being someone who's been given a telescope and is using it to crack nuts. Or somebody who's inherited a gold mine and isn't exploring it, but is enjoying the fact that they can shelter from the rain and the doorway of it. Or maybe, maybe we're standing in a field in a basket with a deflated balloon next to us, quaffing champagne, thinking that we're special and the view is wonderful from here. And I want to stick with that sort of analogy of balloons with the Bristol. And it's easy to put that spirit that we have to activate. The spirit will start to fill the balloon. And we have to... And when they light the balloons, they light the balloons when the outside is beginning to get dark. The air temperature is getting cold. It's drawing in. The day is coming to a close. And that's when the balloons can really take effect. And so they roar on the, on the heaters. And you see when they go, they really go. We wonder if we're hot and cold, but the bottles of propane, because they're, um, they're, they're evaporating the, the gas so quickly, they start to freeze, and the burners start getting so hot that they, the stainless steel starts discolouring and going blue, and they keep it going, and they keep it going, and it lights up the whole balloon, and it draws people. They come down to see, and these balloons start, and you don't stop mustn't be satisfied with only half full because that's not the purpose okay it's different to everybody else but you need to keep it burning keep it burning keep it burning because then it will start to lift and then it will have an effect because it's going to have two effects on those it will draw people and it will repel others it will be light and it will be it will say righteousness godliness spirit and to a lot of people that is a smell of death so you cannot avoid the fact that our very presence, the presence of him who raised Jesus from the dead inside us is going to cause controversy for, and, and, and it's going to cause a backlash and we can't appease our way out of it. We can't, you know, it's, it's coming. We've just got to own up to that. But you keep it going, you keep the flame going and then your world will start to shudder. And then you find what's attaching you, what's holding you to the ground. What are those things? And then you can let go. I mean, unforgiveness would be like an iron horse. You need to cut that. And care and worry about things. If you wake up and you think more about your mortgage than you do about God, then you need to undo that and be free from that because you will sail and go. And I think of the, you know, because it's the temptation not to say anything that might be a little bit, but Jesus did. And I think of the, of the, of the of the parable of the ten virgins. Foolish virgins, they're called in the thing. And they're not the condemned or the wicked or the anything. They're just foolish. They, of their own volition, didn't do, didn't get oil when they needed to. And we must find that we're not in that position. Because people filling up their balloons with gas will suddenly find... Eh, it's controversy around it. People are getting funny, so you won't do too much of it. And this thing will just stay half inflated on the ground. And when it comes to matter, it's not going to help you any. And cowardice isn't a place. It's, it's, we're in a very, very unique, special time. And I just want to end just with the last thought of this all. 
is going back to a god of stories and wonder and amazement is that people really, really are irritated by this. They did carbon dating. They did carbon dating from, uh, the other one will show it, but they took, they were allowed to cut a little corner from the, from the edges and carbon dating it. And they were very, very, very inconsistent. But some of it seemed to point to the Middle Ages, and so there was a great trumpeting of, the, of this being a, a, a fake. But somebody rather annoyingly pointed out that like, it's a patch. We've carbon dated a patch. It's evidently been repaired there. But the desire of so many people to rubbish anything that a god of wonder would do, a god of stories and brilliance would do, the desire to rubbish it comes from a lot of places. And what the worrying is, a lot of the desire to rubbish it comes from believers. Now, something that you said about the Orthodox, the um, Ukrainians reacting against orthodoxy. This country reacted heavily against orthodoxy in the 16th and 17th century after the Civil War. And so even the word hocus pocus, to mean nonsense, is a mockery of the Latin, um, the Latin service. Hocus pocus, you know, corpus Christ, the body of Christ, is a mockery of that because there was such a reaction against that. And we do, we oversteer and then we overreact, and it's ridiculous anyway, we need not to. But if, to believe this, if you have any of this cynicism in you, this desire to make less, make smaller, make less wonderful, and call it wisdom, and call it maturity, I think more for you. And I think if it's understandable. If you've only known winter, if you've only known trees which are seemingly dead sticks, and someone's trying to tell you, in a month, they're just going to be nothing but flowers. It's going to be a flower tree, like the cherry trees that we see. You would think, oh yeah, maybe it sounds a bit fanciful. Sounds a bit very, maybe it's an allegory. Maybe it's going to there'll be something, or there'll be a shade, or there's something. But that, the God, we've got the evidence of what the God that we know, the God who, who, who is within us, does. It takes dead sticks and they make it extraordinary. And only because we're used to it, we're not overwhelmed, if we are, with wonder. And this is just what, that we live with a God of story, a God of wonder, and we're moving into a wonderful, wonderful time. So don't be robbed of it by mediocrity and pettiness. It'd be such a shame. And from, and just will conclude, and this is something interesting, and I don't know why I'm really, that when it says that we, we live in the spirit and we speak, and we, when we pray from the spirit, and I'm trying this new thing, where when I, if I have to speak French, and I need to speak a French accent. The way I learned to do it was speak English in a very strong French accent. And so on, she changed, and donc she spoke, je parle français comme un français. And I don't know many words, but uh, because I do that, when I pray in tongues, <coughs> I'm not engaging my being in that. I'm, it's just my spirit. And so now, without changing, I start to want to pray from the Spirit. Peace be upon you that your future has so many roses. It's lined with roses. Peace and love and fullness. And just praying, moving into the Spirit. Moving into the Spirit. The expectation of good, the expectation of truth is accelerating in this time as the evening comes in. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for your humour and your love. And I ask in the name of Jesus that we can connect with you as you are and know that love and that life and joy inside us and help us just throw off everything that isn't you. Everything that isn't you. And that we can, like balloons, soar over the city completely different. Amen. Amen.